Hello and welcome. I'm Don Renfrew and I'm going to be speaking for the next hour or so on imaging of genitourinary symptoms. I'm a private practice radiologist. I work with a group um, called Radiology Associates of the Fox Valley. The Fox Valley is located in the north central portion of Wisconsin and we're a private practice group of about 30 radiologists that covers multiple hospitals. This talk is for primary care practitioners. Um, as noted on this slide, the percentage of primary care uh, or the percentage of uh, medical school seniors going into primary medicine, uh, particularly into family medicine, has decreased significantly in the last 10 years or so. Uh, for that reason, there are probably going to be uh, more and more folks doing primary care who are not physicians, but rather are nurse practitioners and physicians assistants. Uh, these talks are for primary care providers, whether they're in internal medicine or family medicine, the emergency room, or um, physician assistants or nurse practitioners. Uh, note that according to the Government Accounting Office, there are about 260,000 primary care physicians in the U.S. in 2005, where there's about 200, I'm sorry, there, there are about 23,000 uh, physicians assistants in 2007, and there's about 82,000 nurse practitioners in 2005. Um, so it does seem like primary care is going to be performed more and more by physician assistants and nurse practitioners for at least three different reasons. Um, one of which is fewer uh, medical students are going into primary care. Uh, another of which is that most of your central planning uh, will call for increased numbers of uh, PAs and NPs. And finally, um, a lot of clinics are hiring more NPs and PAs to do the primary care as well. Uh, so again, this talk is directed toward those people in primary care that want to know what to order uh, in radiology. Um, this is Door County Memorial Hospital where I work. Uh, I'm a general practice radiologist and have been for some time. Um, I'm responsible in the hospital for the grand rounds, which uh, consists of interesting case conferences and tumor boards. Uh, I found when presenting material to primary care physicians at uh, Door County Memorial Hospital that many of them were much more interested in which uh, study to order and, uh, and what the study could show them uh, and what diseases it would pick up and which ones it would miss uh, more than they were in the physics of uh, instrumentation um, and fine anatomic detail on any given study. So um, in response to that, I made up a set of lectures, which this is one of those, uh, having to do with uh, radiology. And basically the gist of these uh, uh, lectures is what to order when you have certain specific patient symptoms. So uh, you have many imaging options for uh, the genital urinary system. You're not even limited by what you see on this slide, uh, which includes ultrasound study, uh, hysterosalpingogram, MR, CT, um, uh, and so forth. At the same time, you really want to order the right study the first time every time you do a study. And uh, because of that, I'm going to try to give you some rules to follow when you're ordering studies in the genital urinary system. Um, now, this is basically sort of the second of two lectures on the genital urinary system. And this lecture deals with the female pelvis and the male scrotum. Uh, it's going to talk about postmenopausal bleeding and premenopausal bleeding or abnormal uterine bleeding. It's going to talk about adnexal pain and masses, and it's going to talk about scrotal lesions. Um, now, you may have already heard the lecture uh, that I've given on renal symptoms, which uh, and the imaging of renal symptoms. But I do want to take just a minute here to review four signs and symptoms of possible renal origin, just to kind of review that material to make sure everybody remembers that or, or, or learns it here. Um, so what are the four signs and symptoms of possible renal origin that I covered in that lecture and we'll briefly note here. Um, the first of these is hematuria. Um, for hematuria, you want to do a CT study without and with contrast material and you're looking for the common and uncommon diseases that may cause hematuria like renal stone disease, renal cancer, collecting system cancers. Also, people with hematuria will, in addition to the CT scan, they'll get cystoscopy built for bladder tumors because you won't see all bladder tumors with CT study. 
for acute onset of flank pain, the so-called CTKUB or unenhanced CT of the abdomen and pelvis is a study of choice. Uh, and the reason that you do that is uh, it's much faster and uh, more accurate than IDP or ultrasound studies in evaluation of acute flank pain of suspected renal origin. If you're looking for a stone, it'll show you the size of the stones, it'll show you where they are in the collecting system. Uh, those two features will help you determine whether or not that stone is going to pass on its own or need instrumentation or some help. Um, and it'll also uh, give you a good idea of the degree of obstruction by noting how distant the collecting system is. Uh, with respect to hypertension, uh, you've got a couple of different options. Most people with hypertension, of course, don't need imaging, but those that do need imaging, you're looking for renal vascular causes, renal artery stenosis, fibromuscular dysplasia, other diseases of the renal artery. Uh, when you're looking for those diseases, probably the best single test is going to be CT angiography. MR angiography can also be used. Uh, renal ultrasound in certain specialized laboratories where they do it all the time, they can probably at least get better results than the general uh, community hospital with respect to ultrasound, but usually it's a CT angiography for suspected renal vascular hypertension. Finally, when you have new onset of decreased renal function or renal failure, elevated creatinine, uh, probably the first study of choice is going to be ultrasound, and that's going to tell you whether it's a, a urologic problem with an obstruction to flow into stented renal collecting systems or a, more of a, a, a medical renal disease where you've got shrunken kidneys or even normal kidneys, no distension. Uh, so those people really have renal failure and they may require a biopsy to ultimately figure out what the renal disease is, but the important point is to figure out whether they're obstructed or not if they have new onset renal failure. All right, so that brings us to today's topics. Again, postmenopausal and premenopausal bleeding, adnexal pain, mass, and scrotal lesions. Um, now, as far as bleeding goes, ultrasound is going to be the imaging study of choice for evaluating both premenopausal and postmenopausal bleeding. Um, in an article in UpToDate by Goodman uh, called The Evaluation and Management of Uterine Bleeding in Postmenopausal Women. Uh, it says that all postmenopausal women with unexpected uterine bleeding should be evaluated for endometrial carcinoma since this potentially lethal disease will be the cause of bleeding in about 10% and the range is 1 to 25% depending on the risk factors. Uh, however, the most common causes of bleeding in these women is uh, atrophy of the vaginal mucosa or endometrium. So. It does make sense that these uh, patients, when they come for their uh, uh, ultrasound study, are kind of mentally prepared for it. And women undergoing um, pelvic ultrasound, we usually have two different types of studies done. One of which is a transabdominal study, and that requires a full bladder. So if you are sending a patient for uh, pelvic ultrasound, uh, from your office, make sure that they don't empty their bladder on the way to the radiology department. Otherwise, when they get there, they'll just have to drink water and wait until they get the bladder full enough to have a, a nice acoustic window to see the uterus and ovaries through the anteroabdominal wall. The, the exam is, can be mildly uncomfortable because you're pushing the probe against sort of a full bladder. Um, the bladder can be partly full and still get a fairly good exam. It kind of depends on the patient's anatomy. Um, the second part of the exam, however, uh, is the endovaginal, or also known as a transvaginal study. And that, um, of course, requires insertion of the probe into the vagina. Of course, you're not going to do that on um, non-sexually active women or young women, uh, or any woman who doesn't desire to have that done. Uh, so it is good that women know that that's part of the exam, though, and you do get much better detail the endometrial stripe and the endnexa, and you can see things much better uh, on a transvaginal study than you can on a transabdominal study. Um, another method of examination is the so-called sonohistogram. In that, that requires cannulization of the uh, uh, cervical canal, and then you put water into the uh, endometrial canal through a catheter. And that distends the endometrium and shows you the endometrial lining a lot better and focal abnormalities. Um, at least in my hospital, the gynecologists don't really tend to use that study much. Uh, and their thinking on that is that if they're going to go to the point of using instrumentation and entering the cervix, 
they might as well put a hysteroscope in there because then they can not only look at the lining, but also do any biopsies that they might need at the same time. So it's not a frequently used test, at least in our hospital, but other places they may use it more. Um, of course, in addition to the grayscale images, uh, ultrasound studies incorporate color, color Doppler imaging and graphs and spectral Doppler imaging as part of the uh, evaluation. Uh, now, uh, with respect to this algorithm, pelvic ultrasound does fit into the algorithm for the workup of uh, postmenopausal and, post and premenopausal bleeding. I am kind of talking first about postmenopausal bleeding because even though ultrasound is a study of choice for abnormal uterine bleeding, whether it's premenopausal or postmenopausal, uh, the disease processes are a little different, so I'll talk about postmenopausal bleeding first. It's certainly the more kind of al alarming of the, of the two symptoms, uh, basically. Um, so, in Goodman, in the same article in UpToDate, it, 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 he also says, quote, uterine bleeding in postmenopausal women is usually light and self-limited. Exclusion of cancer is the main objective. Therefore, treatment is usually unnecessary once cancer has been excluded. Further diagnostic evaluation is indicated for recurrent or persistent bleeding. So in the algorithm here, you start out at the top with postmenopausal bleeding. Uh, do you have endometrial cancer? No, you don't really need treatment. Uh, you do have endometrial cancer, you need uh, treatment for the cancer. Um, now, what other causes are there besides endometrial cancer? This is a study of uh, over a thousand women evaluated for postmenopausal bleeding. And here's your list, and the number one cause is atrophy. Uh, and then after that are polyps, endometrial cancer, endometrial hyperplasia, hormone effect, cervical cancer. So how many of those are, are going to show up on ultrasound, and what is ultrasound going to show? Um, you know, a normal endometrial stripe or a thin endometrial stripe can be seen in atrophy. Most of the other abnormalities listed here are going to cause a thickened endometrial stripe, sometimes focally, but often diffusely, even in what would seem to be focal processes like endometrial cancer. The, uh, the main finding is going to be diffuse uh, thickening of the um, endometrium. Um, now, how thick is too thick? Well, in a lecture by Deborah Levine from a course called Diagnostic Imaging, a Comprehensive Review, and the lecture was titled Evaluation of the Endometrium and Sonohistrography, for postmenopausal women, less than four millimeters is normal, and greater than eight is definitely abnormal. Five to eight is sort of no man's land, and generally speaking, the recommendation is to uh, pursue those women with biopsy if there's bleeding, but otherwise probably not. So the uh, ultrasound is not being done for postmenopausal bleeding, and you have a five or six millimeter endometrial stripe. <clears throat> you may not need a biopsy in those cases. Um, now, a lot of articles have been written about whether four or five millimeters or some other number is the appropriate cutoff value for endometrial stripe thickness. Um, and, you know, that's going to be continue, a continued area of concern, but I, I guess one thing to remember is that, uh, uh, as it says in, in Chapter 9 of Callum's classic textbook on ultrasound and obstetrics and gynecology, uh, quote, uh, this measurement, the four or five measurement, uh, four or five millimeter measurement, has been overused as the only sonographic sign of endometrial abnormalities. And the endometrial stripe should be uniform, and any irregularity or variation in thickness should be treated with suspicion, even if the measurement's within normal limits. So it's not only important to have a uh, uh, thickness measure, uh, uh, evaluation of the endometrial stripe, but also whether there are any focal abnormalities of the stripe. Um, so, ultrasound of an endometrium with a normal or thin endometrial stripe may indicate atrophy, and why would atrophy lead to bleeding? Well, um, hypo, uh, again, this is Goodman's article in UpToDate, as he says there, hypoestrogenism will cause atrophy of the endometrium and the vagina, and in the uterus, the collapsed atrophic endometrial surfaces contain little or no fluid to prevent intracapitary friction. This results in microerosions of the surface epithelium, and then a subsequent chronic inflammatory reaction and chronic endometritis which is prone to light bleeding or spotting, so atrophy, uh, not enough lubricants in there, uh, the, the cervix sticks, uh, the uh, endometrial uh, surfaces stick together, uh, leads to a little bit of irritation and some spotting. Um, now, this is a case of a focal abnormality of the endometrial stripe. Um, on our image on the left, you have a transabdominal ultrasound, and you can tell that in a number of ways, one of which is that there's a bladder 
full of uh, urine, which is dark or black on the ultrasound here, um, in front of the uterus, and then I think an endometrial stripe within the uterus. On the image on our right is a transvaginal study where the probe is much closer to the uterus, and you get the feeling that the endometrial stripe is uh, more irregular. Uh, this image show, shows the same two pictures, and the slide shows the same two pictures with arrows. The arrows on the left show the endometrial stripe, the thickened endometrial stripe on a transabdominal ultrasound, and the arrows on the, uh, on the image on the right show focal thickening of the endometrial stripe. And this actually was indeed uh, an endometrial polyp, uh, and uh, endometrial polyps can cause bleeding in both pre- and postmenopausal women. Um, again, in the article in Up to Date, uh, Goodman says, quote, polyps are benign endometrial growths of unknown etiology that are a common cause of perimenopausal and early postmenopausal urine bleeding. Uh, growth of polyps can be stimulated by estrogen replacement therapy or tamoxifen, which is, of course, the uh, cancer therapy drug. Uh, now, when you have an endometrial stripe, which is thick, that is going to be worrisome for endometrial cancer. Um, and it's interesting to note that even though 90 to 95 percent of postmenopausal bleeding is due to benign cause, the incidence of cancer uh, as a cause of uterine bleeding increases with increasing age. Um, adenocarcinoma increase is the most common kind of genital cancer in women over the age of 45. Um, and basically, the additional risk factors include uh, uh, women who have never been pregnant and who are over the age of 70 and who have diabetes. If you put those three things together, and someone that has postmenopausal bleeding over age 70, never had, uh, never been pregnant, and has diabetes, or something like that, 90% risk of complex hyperplasia or endometrial cancer, compared to about a 3% risk in women without these three characteristics. Um, in this particular case, uh, there's a transabdominal ultrasound uh, that was done, and you can see here the uterine cavity with a thick endometrium. This image has arrows on uh, delimit uh, delimiting the anterior and posterior margins of the endometrium. The endometrium is abnormally thickened, um, and this ended up. Uh, this woman had a, had a single episode of bright red blood, and that was followed by some spotting. She initially had an endometrial biopsy that showed a benign polyp, but no malignancy, and the ultrasound was actually done after the biopsy. The ultrasound after this biopsy, which showed a benign polyp, but no malignancy, showed a thick endometrial stripe. And because of the thickness of that endometrial stripe, the patient went to hysteroscopy and B and C, and the diagnosis of endometrial cancer was made. So this is an example of where the addition of an ultrasound study to the endometrial biopsy actually improved patient management. Now, this 80-year-old woman had some vaginal spotting and a large endometrial mass, along with an atrophic uterus. The uterus is much smaller in this patient. And there's some fluid in the endometrial cavity. Uh, this image has arrows uh, on the picture on the left delimiting the endometrial and the uh, uterus, which is quite small, and the, there's kind of debris and fluid inside the endometrial cavity uh, on both the uh, sagittal and axial images here. Um, this ended up being endometrial cancer. Um, another Histologic uh, abnormality that can cause a thick endometrial stripe is hyperplasia. Uh, in the up-to-date article by Goodman, it says uh, since postmenopausal women should be estrogen deficient, endometrial hyperplasia uh, at this time is abnormal and it requires an explanation. Uh, it can be secondary to estrogen ex endogenous estrogen production from an ovarian or ad adrenal tumor, or exogenous estrogen from therapy. Even though it wasn't included in that table, uh, one thing that you'll see occasionally is a submucosal fibroid 
as a cause of bleeding and it's felt that it either uh, distorts or disturbs or interrupts the endometrial lining uh, to the point where bleeding can occur. That may be seen more frequently in premenopausal women, can occasionally occur in postmenopausal women. Uh, this is actually an ultrasound in a 40-year-old premenopausal woman, prolonged abnormal uterine bleeding. It shows a large hypoechoic mass where the long arrows are, um, and it dis those disrupt the endometrial strike. Um, and basically, that, uh, that, that, that caused bleeding in this, in this woman. Um, now, the little asterisks here um, are noting the stripes that are coming off of the mass, and that is sort of a typical appearance called a Venetian blind shadowing, and you'll see that in uh, fibroids, probably because of calcification, or foci of calcification within the tumor. Uh, and that's a pretty characteristic finding for uh, fibroids. Now, as I mentioned before, you can use either ultrasound or biopsy to evaluate postmenopausal bleeding, and, and sometimes both. Um, I think either one, you know, either one is a good idea, uh, and it kind of depends on the local practice patterns. Um, you can usually um, figure out whether someone does have cancer or not by the combination of ultrasound or biopsy. Um, you can use either one as the initial test. Uh, and if you have um, persistent bleeding after a biopsy shows a benign diagnosis, as in the case we showed earlier, then you might consider rediagnosis. Uh, or, I'm sorry, re-biopsy. Um, now, to go on to the premenopausal bleeding, uh, note that uh, premenop the premenopausal, I'm sorry, the premenopausal causes of bleeding are somewhat different than the postmenopausal causes of bleeding. And as one source uh, notes, uh, that there's a confusing, inconsistent, and overlapping array of terms which has evolved to describe the abnormal frequency, duration, and volume of uterine bleeding. Um, therefore, usually you just use a, kind of the general term abnormal uterine bleeding, or that's the term that's often used. And uh, pelvic ultrasound is employed in these cases to figure out where, how thick the endometrial stripe is. And you're looking again for polyps, hyperplasia, and malignancy that may occur in premenopausal patients. Now, in this particular case, um, here on slide 36, there's an ultrasound with a thick endometrial stripe, and that may indicate a secretory endometrium, and indeed that was what the diagnosis was in this particular case, uh, where you see between the arrows uh, a thickened endometrium. Um, secretory endometrium may cause a thick endometrial stripe, uh, and because of that, it's usually preferable to perform ultrasound studies in the first few days after the cessation of menses. Um, but that does assume a predictable pattern of bleeding, and a lot of these patients don't have a predictable pattern of bleeding. Um, as I noted above, um, submucosal fibroids can cause bleeding in premenopausal patients um, as well. Uh, they're less likely to cause bleeding in postmenopausal patients. So that sort of concludes the abnormal uterine bleeding segment of this talk. And again, the important point there is ultrasound is done. You mainly look at the endometrial stripe, see if there's any focal abnormality, or see if there's diffuse thickening. And then uh, try to direct whether the patient needs biopsy or rebiopsy on the basis of that. So important point number two for this talk is that ultrasound is the image study of choice for evaluating adnexal pain and masses. Um, a couple of things to note about adnexal pain in masses is that women may present with pelvic masses or pain in the adnexa or painful masses or they may have pain in the adnexa and a mass found on the ultrasound which may not be the cause of the pain. Um, and I'm going to kind of combine discussion of the entities here with a discussion of the painful lesions followed by a discussion of the masses. Uh, but there is going to be overlap between these sets of patients. Um, 
in up to date an article by Hoffman called uh, "Overview of the Evaluation and Management of Axial Masses." It says, "quote An ultrasound exam is the most valuable diagnostic study in the evaluation of adnexal or pelvic mass." Um, and in an up-to-date article by Droz and Howard called Evaluation of Acute Pelvic Pain, uh, quote, historically ultrasound examination has been the initial imaging modality in the evaluation of pelvic pain in women because of its low cost, absence of radiation exposure, readily availability, and a readily ready availability and the ease of use. Um, Furthermore, it, sa uh, it says in that article that abdomen and pelvic CT or MR can be used for further evaluation in cases of diagnostic uncertainty. And uh, plain films of the abdomen and pelvis are rare and useful in the diagnosis of gynecologic pathology. I'll actually talk about women with pelvic and abdominal pain as part of the gastrointestinal uh, lectures in this series. Uh, so I'm not going to dwell a lot on the CT aspects of that here. Uh, we'll kind of go on to what ultrasound is going to, how, how ultrasound is going to help you with adnexal pain and masses. Um, this is a brief algorithm, uh, and uh, on this algorithm, note that um, pelvic ultrasound fits into this algorithm in the workup of adnexal masses. So you have an adnexal mass in a postmenopausal woman. You have to figure out: is it a simple cyst? Uh, is there? An asymptomatic pelvic exam is a normal cervical cytology and is there a normal CA125. And if the answer is yes to all those uh, questions, then you can kind of re, uh, re image sequentially for cysts. Um, otherwise, you, most of these women with an adnexal mass of any complexity uh, go to a gynecologist or even a gynecologic oncologist. Um, It is interesting to note that uh, Hoffman's article in Up to Date called Overview of the Evaluation and Management of Adnexal Masses that um, the, uh, he, he, he sh cites a large study where they were looking at sensitivity and specificity of a bimanual exam of ultrasound, of MR, of CT, of PET, and of CA125 serum values. And uh, uh, according to the article by Hoffman, the authors concluded that all diagnostic modalities show trade-offs between sensitivity and specificity. But the available literature doesn't provide sufficient detail on relevant characteristics of study populations to allow confident estimations of the optimal diagnostic strategy. So the same article goes on to state that simple cysts, hemorrhagic cysts, endometriomas, and dermoids often have a characteristic ultrasound features that can uh, be highly predictive of a histologic diagnosis. It's not the same as certainty, but it does get you a fair amount along the way. So again, there's certain lesions in the index that have characteristic appearance uh, that uh, lead you to a certain amount of diagnostic uh, um, stability. Um, now, these recommendations on this slide are for postmenopausal women. For premenopausal women, um, the article in Up Today by Hoppen says, quote, we suggest expectant management of premenopausal women with newly diagnosed asymptomatic small simple ovarian cysts. We suggest surgery for diagnosis and treatment of ovarian cysts that are large, persistent, or symptomatic, and those with findings suspicious for malignancy. All right, now how are pelvic pain and pelvic masses related? Uh, as I mentioned above, there may be any number of relationships, uh, including no relationship. Uh, this table provides some generalities, but we all recognize that it's at best a rough approximation. So, in general, new onset mid cycle pain, you think of physiologic cyst. Pain after intercourse, you think of a ruptured uh, uh, ovarian cyst. A dyspanorrhea, you think of endometriosis. Acute onset of, nausea, of pain with nausea and vomiting, which does sound a little like appendicitis, especially if it's in the uh, right lower quadrant. We think of ovarian torsion with that too. Uh, pain and fever, appendicitis again, but also pelvic inflammatory disease and diverticulitis. And finally, with chronic pain, uh, you, you may think in terms of ovarian neoplasm, but also necrotic fibroids. Um, how about the menstrual history? Does that help? Well, somewhat. Uh, anytime you have a missed period, of course, in a uh, uh, woman of childbearing age, you have to worry about ectopic pregnancy. Uh, uh, menorrhagia and dysmenorrhea, you have to think about fibroids. 
Postmenopausal bleeding, full of being tube cancer is a rare cause, and these are again the adnaxalations, not lesions of the endometrium. And then abnormal uterine bleeding in breast centers and cystism, you think of sex cord stromal tumors. Again, these are very rare diagnoses, and, but those are the associations clinically with some of the adnaxal masses in the menstrual history. Um, now, pelvic ultrasound does in detect, indeed detect the important cause, uh, causes of ad adnexal masses and pelvic pain. Um, what are your main causes of pelvic pain uh, or a mass is going to be a simple cyst. Now, a simple cyst has, uh, is a cyst with no solid component. Uh, they may cause pain because of expansion of the ovarian capsule. Uh, they may cause pain because of rupture. Uh, sometimes a rupture will not leave much cyst fluid, and so it's hard to see these cysts on the ultrasound, but you kind of assume there is been a cyst that ruptured if you see a lot of free fluid in the pelvis and you see a, over a bit of an abnormal margin on it. Um, also, cysts can be painful because they have a hemor hemorrhage into the cyst. Uh, however, given the frequent appearance of cysts in asymptomatic patients, a causal connection between the cysts and the pelvic pain can often be difficult to establish. Uh, there's some rules that people follow for premenopausal patients. If you have a simple cyst, smaller than three centimeters, these almost always represent what they call a dominant or graphene follicle. And some authors actually advocate using the term follicle instead of the, the, the term cyst, even though cyst is uh, technically accurate. Um, uh, and if, if you use the term follicle, it seems to be a little less loaded, a little less problematic, uh, especially if there's asymptomatic. Uh, simple cysts bigger than 10 centimeters will usually undergo surgical exploration. So that leaves all the cysts between 3 and 10 centimeters, and, and they're usually followed by sequential ultrasound. Uh, and the, the recommendations for following, uh, following these 3 to 10 centimeter cysts are kind of all over the map. Uh, if they're asymptomatic and incidentally found, uh, you may not want to do very much with them in premenopausal women. Uh, but uh, official recommendations and articles and books you'll see uh, include a single a repeat ultrasound done a few days after the next menstrual cycle um, or uh, studies done at three months intervals all the way up to two years. Uh, most of the cysts will decrease in size over a 12 to 24 month period. Um, how about postmenopausal patients? Well, you, you move the size criteria downward and the intervention criteria upward and basically uh, you recommend follow up with pretty much all the cysts or at least all the ones that are over 20 millimeters and you surgically explore all the ones that are over five centimeters. Um, again, the recommendation is going to vary about this. Uh, in most cases, you do a CA125, uh, and if that's elevated, then you kind of surgically explore and take the cyst out. Uh, so it's kind of ovarian cysts in a nutshell. How about hemorrhagic ovarian cysts? Well, of course, hemorrhagic ovarian cysts, that's one of the causes of pain. Hemorrhage into a simple cyst usually causes pain, and the ultrasound appearance of uh, hemorrhagic ovarian cysts is very characteristic and it usually allows a presumptive diagnosis and uh, follow-up to confirm the, uh, the finding. On this slide, the image on the left is at the time of pain in a 42-year-old woman with a sudden onset of pain uh, that had a hemorrhagic ovarian cyst. The image on the right is the same uh, ovary several weeks later after resolution of the symptoms, and you can see that the hemorrhagic cyst is basically completely resolved. And that's uh, sort of a typical uh, clinical scenario. Um, endometriomas can kind of look like endometrial, uh, or I'm sorry, can, uh, endometriosis, endometriosis can kind of look like uh, hemorrhagic cysts, although the echoes tend to be finer and, and, and more delicate as seen in, in this picture. Um, endometriosis usually causes chronic rather than acute pelvic pain. And hemorrhage into the endometrioma may cause acute exacerbation of chronic pain. The ultrasound will often demonstrate a pretty typical homogeneous uh, hypoechoic adnexal lesion like this one. Sometimes imaging features will look like a hemorrhagic cyst, especially if there's been hemorrhage into the endometrioma. Uh, small implants can be pretty tricky to identify on ultrasound, and sometimes people use MR to find those. Um, now, another entity that can cause uh, pain that arises in the annexa is torsion of the ovary. And uh, this uh, example is uh, torsion of the ovary. Usually, uh, ovaries have some cause to twist. Either they have a mass or a cyst, but they can sometimes just twist on their own. When they do twist, it's just like a testicular 
torsion. They, they cause uh, uh, pretty rapid onset of pain, nausea, and vomiting. Uh, patients really don't feel well. Um, can mimic appendicitis if it's in the right lower body. Ultrasound is usually going to show you a swollen ovary, uh, and it can be accompanied by inflammatory free fluid in the pelvis. Um, the color and spectral Doppler studies, you would think they would show you uh, very characteristic findings, and sometimes they do. But here's the problem. Uh, if the ovarian torsion is intermittent, of course, the arterial flow and venous flow are going to be normal between the times it's torsed, but the patient can still be having some pain because of the torsion, which is now reduced. The other problem is that when an ovary is and testicles torsed, the venous outflow is impeded before arterial inflow, and the uh, uh, Doppler ultrasound study really focuses more on the arterial inflow, which may still be patent and, and not look that bad, uh, even though venous outflow is down. So you can have false negative uh, color Doppler images on torsion of the ovary and torsion of the testicle. Um, in terms of pelvic inflammatory disease, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease is a, another cause of pelvic pain. It usually is. Uh, causes pain because of inflammation along the mucosal surfaces. Uh, it results from ascending infection and sexually transmitted disease causing cervicitis and endometritis and then infection of floping tubes and finally pyosal pains. Uh, sonography is often normal prior to the development of pyosal pains. In this particular case, uh, which I will show again in the lecture on lower abdomen and pelvic pain in women, uh, the slide on the left is a CT showing an adnexal lesion. The slide on the right is sort of a classic pyosalpinx with a tadpole-like appearance, and that's a dilated fallopian tube with an abscess at the end of it. How about a degenerating uterine fibroid? Of course, they can cause pelvic pain as well. Uh, and if they're in the adnex, if they're pedunculated off of the uterus, or if the uterus is tilted over to one side, they can sort of present as an adnexal. Uh, location of pain. Um, degenerative immune fibroids, they'll undergo hemorrhage and infarction. Um, ultrasound performs pretty well in the diagnosis of fibroids, um, but one problem is like ovarian cysts, you, there's so many women with fibroids that, uh, and a lot of those women are asymptomatic, so if you have a patient with symptoms and a fibroid, how do you know for sure the fibroid's causing the symptoms? Uh, one thing that you can look at is to see if there are any anechoic areas or Doppler studies would show lack of, lack of blood flow, and those features can suggest infarction. Uh, so in this particular case, there's some low density areas in the middle of a fibroid. You can see the Venetian blind shadowing again of this fibroid. Uh, and it was actually undergoing degeneration from infarction. Um, this line shows the um, ultrasound labeled A, and then a T1 weighted MR labeled B, and the arrows in both cases are on the fibroid. Um, this slide uh, with label C and D shows axial T2 weighted MR images uh, showing the fibroid uh, within the uterus and the fluid or bright signal intensity inside the fibroid. There's a combination of hemorrhage and necrotic debris. Um, the slide labeled D is a post contrast enhancement study, and you can see that there's not any contrast enhancement or white signal on the interior of that cavity. So you know that that part of the uh, uterus is not getting blood flow. It's actually infarcted out at this point. Uh, and this patient um, did go ahead and have treatment for her degenerating uterine fibroid and got better. Uh, this slide is a, a kind of a compilation of the four pictures of the uh, degenerating uterine fibroid. How about a uh, dermoid tumor? Again, as, as I noted earlier, a lot of these adnexal masses will have fairly specific features on ultrasound and allow you to be pretty good at diagnosing exactly what the lesion is. Um, the, uh, the, uh, just to back up a second, in terms of female pelvic masses in general, uh, there are a lot of diseases that produce pelvic masses and many of these will also cause pain. Uh, and I've kind of talked about those. Painless pelvic masses of the uterus of the uterus usually represent fibroids. Uh, painless adnexal lesions may represent simple cysts, uh, which we've talked about already, or a complex mass, often arising in the ovary. Uh, and those complex masses usually require gynecologic or gynecologic oncology referral, especially in a postmenopausal patient. 
Uh, now, researchers have made a lot of attempts to define ultrasound criteria to separate benign and malignant adnexal and ovarian masses, and they've used various imaging features like size and complexity and vascular flow indices, but there's no real imaging feature or set of features that is entirely accurate. Um, so, other than the, uh, you know, you can kind of make a guess as to whether a complex mass may or may not be malignant, but you're not going to be correct all the time. Um, now, cystic and uh, solid combined adnexal lesions uh, are often in a premenopausal patient, a dermoid cyst, and that's what this uh, particular lesion represents. Um, they will usually be removed surgically, although sometimes they're followed at least for a while because they are benign, they're typically a benign uh, lesion. Um, this pelvic mass, which represents a dermoid tumor, shows an ultrasound on the left side. You can see some dense shadowing uh, where the black arrow is, and at the white arrow there's some uh, uh, hypodense or fluid-filled pockets. Uh, the CT examination on the right, the black arrow, is at the location of some dense calcium or bone or even tooth enamel in these tumors. And then the white arrow is actually at the, air, at the, at the location of some fat in the tumor. And when you have that kind of very complex appearance in a young female, it's almost always a, a dermoid tumor. Um, now the next mass I'll talk about, the mass I'll talk about is a, uh, a fibroid in the uterus. Now fibroids are again very common and they usually they don't, you know, require any extensive diagnosis. There are occasions, though, when the lesion is large enough, like this one, and it actually extends off of the uterus, or it can be confusing in diagnosis, and uh, an MR can be performed. So the slide on the left, or the picture on the left, part A, shows the Venetian bind shadowing where the asterisks are, and uh, the arrows uh, showing that shadowing, and then the, it's kind of marked out the lesion there in the myometrium. The image on the right shows kind of a large exophytic uh, fibroid growing up off of the margin of the uterus. Um, So that ends the talk about adnexal pain and adnexal mass is that again, just like abnormal uterine bleeding, pelvic ultrasound is a study of choice that's going to kind of sort out whether there's a lesion there or not, what sort of referral pattern you'll need to go to, whether it's a simple cyst that can be followed or even ignored if it's small enough, whether it's a complex lesion that requires gynecologic or gynecologic or oncologic uh, referral or not, and uh, whether indeed there is an explanation, whether there's an ovarian torsion or something of that nature causing it. Uh, so that leads us to the guys. We're done with the we're done with the girls. We're on to the guys. Ultrasounds a study of choice for evaluation of pretty much all uh, scrotal symptoms. Now, uh, one thing I, I, I that you'll uh, know right away is that you can divide scrotal symptoms using various methods. Uh, for example, you can divide them into how acute the symptoms are. You can divide them into how, by the age of the patient. Um, and uh, in this particular section, I'm going to talk about acute symptoms versus chronic symptoms. Um, now, a lot of these patients are going to come to the emergency room rather than the clinic, but as I've said before, and I'll say again in these lectures, uh, the distinction between the emergency room and the clinic kind of gets blurry sometimes. And you may see plenty of patients with intermittent uh, or even severe uh, acute onset scrotal pain. Uh, so it's nice to know kind of basically what imaging study to use if you need one and uh, what the causes of those, uh, what the cause of, of uh, such pain is. Um, now, if you have a patient with acute scrotal pain, the most likely uh, causes of acute scrotal pain, um, this is a, uh, a paper where they looked at over 200 such patients, and testicular torsion uh, caused about 16% of those episodes of acute pain or were accounted for that many patients. 46% uh, of the patients had torsion in the testicular appendix and 35% epididymitis. So those are kind of the three things you want to uh, figure out whether you're dealing with or not in somebody with acute scrotal pain. Uh, there's less common causes like infection of the scrotal wall and testicular rupture from trauma. Um, and uh, epididymitis and torsion can both occur either with or without associated trauma. Uh, now, uh, in the evaluation of testicular torsion, um, these patients do present with pain. Uh, and the pain is usually acute onset. Uh, it can occur several hours after visit, uh, vigorous physical activity or sometimes minor testicular trauma. Uh, they are, these patients often have, have nausea and vomiting. And then another uh, presentation in kids is awakening with scrotal pain in the middle of the night. Um, 
in testicular torsion, uh, this particular case is a 59-year-old man who'd had four days of scrotal pain by the time he came in to see the doctor and got his ultrasound done. He had no flow in the abnormal testicle, which is on our right. The color flow is seen on the left side. Uh, scrotal ultrasound on the abnormal side shows a, showed a swollen testicle as well as no flow. And basically, there's probably no salvage of this testicle has been uh, dry or uh, absent uh, of vascular too long to be uh, uh, to be uh, salvaged. Um, torsion, of course, uh, cor uh, torsion of cor of course of occurs when uh, the testicle twists on its vascular pedicle that impedes blood flow into and out of the testicle. And uh, this is one of the uh, situations like I talked about in the ovary where the arterial inflow is impeded prior to the uh, venous outflow. And so your color Doppler images uh, may be normal. Uh, spectral Doppler images are a little more sensitive. That's the one where you, you get a waveform, a, a graph of the waveform, and you should see blended flow and some reversible flow during the arterial phase uh, with uh, testicular torsion and the spectral Doppler. But sometimes it can both be normal, either because the uh, torsion's uh, incomplete or, or, or has reversed or intermittent, and uh, I guess the bottom line is there, if you have a patient with, you really think has a torsion, um, their ultrasound, a, a negative ultrasound shouldn't really dissuade you from sending them to the urologist because they could be intermittently torsing their testicle. Of course, a positive study is pretty much an emergency referral because you only have a limited amount of time to fix the testicle before it infarcts. Um, how about uh, torsion of the testicular appendix? The testicular appendix, those, these are uh, 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 little vestigial structures that hang off the anterior superior aspect of the testicle. And they can twist on their pedicles and that will impede blood flow. Uh, that will give you uh, the same kind of symptoms of testicular uh, infarction with associated pain. It's, it's usually less severe than testicular torsion, but it's still severe enough to bring the patient in. Um, and usually you'll see a normal appearance of the testicles and epididymis. Uh, sometimes you'll see a little dot of tissue like the slide. Uh, but you may not. Um, here's a slide with the arrow on the uh, forced testicular appendix. Um, how about epididymitis? Well, ultrasound is a study of choice for epididymitis as well, just like all these other testicular abnormalities. Uh, the epididymis is that structure, again, that connects the testicle to the vas deferens. It's a coiled tubular structure, and it uh, sits along the posterior superior margin of the testicle. Um, inflammation of the epididymis may occur secondary to trauma. Uh, it can occur secondary to severe strain when young men participating in the weightlifting exercise known as squats. Uh, it can occur in bicycle and motorcycle riding and in sexually transmitted diseases. Uh, the epididymis is frequently swollen and painful on the clinical exam, and ultrasound will show a large epididymis with increased flow compared to the contralateral side on color Doppler images. So here's an ultrasound study done for epididymitis, and the uh, image on the left is the normal sign. Uh, normal epididymis shows some color flow in the epididymis adjacent to the testicle. The slide on the right shows an abnormally swollen hyperemic epididymis, and this slide uh, shows that abnormal epididymis with a white arrow leading to the abnormal flow. Um, how about other scrotal infections? Well, uh, there is a nasty infection of the scrotal wall uh, and perineum called Fournier's gangrene, and that's associated, uh, you can assess that with uh, ultrasound. It's going to demonstrate extensive skin thickening and hyperemia with normal testicles deep in the abnormal tissue. Uh, these uh, infections are very nasty and they require emergent referral and treatment, uh, usually extensive surgical treatment. Um, this particular picture uh, shows on the left um, the uh, normal testicle and normal flow inside the swollen scrotum. On the right, that small piece of tissue in the middle is actually the testicle kind of floating in the sea of inflammatory debris. Uh, so this was a, a pretty nasty infection, required extensive debridement. Um, so those are all acute conditions. Again, testicular torsion, torsion of the appendix, epididymitis, um, different causes of a, an acute uh, acutely painful scrotum. How about chronically abnormal uh, scrotum? 
Uh, chronically abnormal scrotum uh, also can be evaluated with ultrasound. And basically, the things you're looking for are either a non palpable testicle in crypt organism, where is the testicle that you're not feeling in the scrotum? Uh, you're also looking for uh, findings of chronic scrotal or uh, causes of chronic scrotal pain, like varicocele and epididymitis. And finally, you're looking for causes of a scrotal mass, like a varicocele, epididymal cyst, spermatocele, and rarely but not so nice cancer. Um, crypt organism. Um, now, in the normal fetus, the testicles are in the scrotal sac at about 36 weeks. Uh, those that fail to descend into the scrotum uh, result in, that results in crypt organism. Um, and an undescended testicle has about a 40 times higher risk of cancer than a testicle within the scrotal sac. So um, you really kind of have to figure out where these testicles are and what, what can be done about them. Um, usually the undescended testicles will manifest as an absence of one or both testicles in the scrotum. And then the undescended testicle, uh, they don't produce sperm as well, and they're prone to malignant degeneration, uh, as I just noted. So most of them are in the inguinal canal, and they can usually be seen on ultrasound, such as this, this case, uh, which shows uh, the normal testicle on the slide, or on the image on the right, and then the elongated testicle within the uh, inguinal canal on the left. Um, if you can't find it in the canal in the ultrasound, another option is to do a CT to look for it in the abdomen. So that's cryptorganism. How about varicocele? Well, varicoceles can cause pain and they can present as a painless mass in the scrotum. Uh, the root problem seems to be venous drainage and on the left side the testicular vein is, uh, runs up from the testicle to the left renal vein, but it enters the renal vein at about a perpendicular angle, and so the left side is much more prone to reflux and varicocele formation. It can also be a cause of um, infertility. An ultrasound can demonstrate kind of a bag of warm appearance adjacent to the testicle, and that's what you'll feel on a physical exam as an abnormal mass, and that's one of the more frequent causes of a, of a mass. In this particular case, there's a 16-year-old with a painless mass in his left scrotum. You have a grayscale ultrasound on the left side uh, showing kind of a bag of worms of Appearance. And then on the right side, um, you have the color doppler imaging showing a very delightful pattern of mixed flow uh, in those veins. Um, this line has an arrow on the, uh, on the uh, varicocele. Um, epididymal cysts. Um, when you have a palpable lesion in the scrotum, uh, most of the extra testicular lesions are going to be benign. They'll either be benign cysts or they'll be varicoceles or sometimes. Uh, um, you know, epididymitis, but the extra testicular stuff uh, is usually okay. Um, epididymal cysts are less than two centimeters, spermatoceles greater than two centimeters, and these lesions will demonstrate a classic ultrasound appearance of a cyst with no echoes in the middle and, and the posterior enhancement, which are open to find a wall and so forth. Uh, so they're, they're pretty much leave me alone lesions uh, in a patient with a palpable testicular lesion. This is kind of what you want to find. Uh, because there's not really much you have to do about it. It's not malignant, it's not pre um, In this particular case, the slide on the left has the arrows on the epididymal cyst, uh, and you can see the testicle uh, toward the right of the slide, um, and then there's a color doppler imaging showing normal color flow in the testicle. So that's an epididymal cyst. Um, finally, Testicular tumors, um, intratesticular tumors, or tumors that seem to either engulf or, or involve the testicle are not good news. Um, uh, there is a, sort of some general tendencies of them having different kinds of ultrasound characteristics. <clears throat> um, and uh, and you, know, you, you can try to make a, a specific cellular diagnosis, but at the end of the day, uh, almost all testicular, in, in, intrinsic testicular lesions have to come out because it's not really typically possible to completely say whether they're benign or malignant, and so they require pathologic evaluation. Um, <coughs> excuse me. This particular young child had a uh, uh, swelling prominence of the scrotum and the ultrasound. Uh, it looked like this was a, a testicular mass. It was actually a mass that had engulfed the uh, uh, it had engulfed the testicle, uh, an orchiectomy was done, and it, this ended up being a malignant rabbit myosarcoma. Um, and that's the last of the testicular topics. So basically, 
you know, the, 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 the root message of this whole talk is pretty simple, and that is ultrasound is done in cases of evaluation for the female pelvis and male scrotum. I have covered why you do the ultrasound, some of the technical details about the ultrasound, and also a good deal about the disease processes and clinical presentation of these patients. But uh, I think if you just remember female pelvis, abnormal uterine bleeding, adnexal pain, adnexal mass, need an ultrasound is the first uh, line of uh, imaging. And then if you just remember on the male side, any scrotal lesion, um, whether it's a palpable lesion or acute pain, uh, scrotal ultrasound is going to be your friend in evaluating those. Uh, thanks for your time and that's the end of this lecture.